Yeah, my name is Geraldine DeBastian. Welcome, hello everybody. And I have the pleasure of moderating the panel Modern Revolutions Are Digital Revolutions. The panel is hosted by Deutsche Welle, who as an international media organization have an inherent interest, of course, in the current political changes taking place in North Africa, and also have an interest in the role that media is playing for political communication and protest organization. And recognizing the growing importance that social media are playing, the Deutsche Welle annually premieres blogs in different language categories in their Best of Blog Awards. And we have here with us today two of the judges of this year's awards who are experts in the northern and western African blogosphere. And with the program director for the Deutsche Welle Amharic program in Ethiopia. And together we will discuss the question as to how far the revolutions that we've seen taking place can actually be termed as digital revolutions, and how far we can say that Egypt, Tunisia, and Libya are setting a signal for the rest of Africa. So we're going to take a closer look together at the factors that have actually led to social media taking the role that it has. We're going to have a look at the impact that they're having on the protest, and we're going to think about as to how far there's a scenario in other African countries for social media also to be used as a protest platform. So to discuss this issue here with us today, as I said, we have three experts, and I would like to uh, welcome on the stage, first of all, I can't see it's very dark back there, but I think she's there, Amira Al Husseini. Amira is from Bahrain. She works as a columnist, editor, and translator. And she's been blogging since 2004. Take the stage. Nice. Welcome. And it's your second time here with us at Republica, correct? So Amira has been blogging since 2004. She joined Global Voices in 2006, where she works as the editor for the North African and Middle Eastern section, and also as the editor for the Arabic language section, correct? And she's been very involved in the recent coverage of events, so she'll share a little bit of her experiences from the last months with us today. Uh, second, I'd like to invite Claire Ulrich to the stage. Claire grew up, I see her coming, yes, there she is. <laughs> Claire grew up in Western Africa. Welcome, Claire. Bonjour. And after 20 years of experience in um, TV and journalism as a whole, uh, Claire started taking an interest in citizen journalism. And today she edits the French version of Global Voices. And like Amira, Claire is also a member of the Best of Blogs jury. Um, her particular interests are the Francophone um, blogosphere in Africa, translation tools, as well as freedom of online expression and skills needed in developing countries. And last but not least, I'd like to welcome Ludger Shadonsky, who has worked for Deutsche Welle and is a freelance journalist in some of Africa's political hotspots. Welcome, Ludga. Ludga was, for instance, involved in uh, working in South Africa during the period of transition, but also in countries like Liberia, Somalia, and the DRC. And since 2006, Ludga has been working for Deutsche Welle as a Mari program director, and I think you also published a book last year called Africa, Continent of Change, right? Okay. So um, I'm very glad to have you three here with us today. Before we actually begin with the discussion, I think we're going to watch a short film produced by Deutsche Welle just to set the scenes. Tunisia is where it all began. A young man publicly set himself on fire in protest against poverty and injustice. A wave of angry demonstrations swept across the country, organized by young people who connected via YouTube, Twitter, and various blogs. Other sections of the population soon joined the protests. Despite the regime's brutal response, the demonstrations continued to grow. And eventually the army ordered President Zain al abidin Ben Ali to relinquish power and go into exile in Saudi Arabia. Influenced by the success of the Tunisian uprising, Egyptians also began to organize their own revolution via the internet.
Protesters gathered peacefully in Tahrir Square, demanding an end to Hosni Mubarak's regime. Yet the president attempted to disperse the protesters, bribing his supporters to cause chaos. Despite his maneuvers to stay in power, Hosni Mubarak was finally overthrown by the Egyptian army. Tahrir Square in downtown Cairo has become the symbol of the Egyptians' liberation from the Mubarak regime. After 41 years under Gaddafi, Libyans began to destroy the symbols of his repressive regime. When the first victims fell in Libya, the pictures went around the globe via YouTube. Despite a rigorous blockade of the media, the eccentric ruler lost the propaganda war. Large parts of his army turned against him. As atrocities committed by Gaddafi's mercenaries became public, the pressure on Western states to intervene grew. Nevertheless, Libya's fate still hangs in the balance. Okay, heavy pictures, of course, and um, and that brings us right to the point. Um, you've just come in from Bahrain, Amira, um, and just recently the Reporters Without Borders, uh, Enemies of the Internet report was released. Bahrain is known as a country that uses very repressive um, tools and tactics as well from filtering mechanisms, um, but also repression against bloggers, people in person. We know um, of the, the police state that Tunisia was at least, and, and the transition has been at the moment. So I'd like to just begin by asking how under these circumstances can um, digital media play a role at all? What are the circumstances people using them are under? Oh, we've just seen all the footage, and uh, this is just the peak of the iceberg. Um, the whole region has gone through a period of turmoil, and a real fast period of turmoil. Uh, with social media, the, the struggle with, with the authorities started a very long time ago from the onset of uh, social media. It was a thing that the governments were finding very difficult to understand because for the first time in our collective history as, as human beings, we're able to publish things without, without, without a censor, without an editor, without a publisher. At the click of a button, you're there, you're connected, you can tell the whole world how you feel, what your dreams are, what your aspirations, and people are able to connect to you as a human being, as a person. You're no longer uh, part of a mass. Like, I know you, I know Mohammed, I know Mahmoud, I know Amira, I know... You, you know people on a one-on-one -on -one basis, and you, you interact with them. You could be anywhere around the world, and you see, those are normal people. Like, they're not the stereotype, they're not the image of people you see, and it's the same with every single blogosphere around the world. Uh, and then came all the other social media tools, so it started with blogs. The repression against blogs is just uh, the same in the same line and the same thought. Media has been repressed and censored throughout the mm -hmm. ages. Television stations and radio stations across the Arab world are traditionally owned by the government. Mainstream media are either directly government controlled, like newspapers, or they're heavily censored. No publisher can afford to stay in business and continue publishing a paper if the government is angry with them, because it's a governmental decision whether this station continues to run or this newspaper continues to get published. So against this backdrop, we have, um, we, uh, by the year 2004, we started having people expressing their voices on their own as independent people and speaking out. And oh. it was 
then that the government started repressing online media with more intensity than, than mainstream media. Right, and, and I think we'll get back to that as well. Um, but since you spoke here last year also on, the, um, on basically the same region and the state mm -hmm. of the blogosphere, and you've been following this situation very closely and just said now that for the first time people had this outlet through the technology. Mm -hmm. So as to how far would you say um, internet and digital media served as a catalyst to the protests that we've been seeing? People have been angry. People have been really angry about the overall situation on the ground. And we've seen that in small protests and in small clashes with government. But what happened with Tunisia was it, it ignited that hope that by the power of people, by the sheer will of hundreds of thousands of people or even millions in the case of Egypt going out on the streets and demanding their right. That's very touching. Like what we saw there is, is something as an Arab, I, I, I still cannot come to terms with it and I still cannot believe that it actually happened. Tunisia took us by surprise. Egypt as a copycat revolution took us by surprise. And that's where the, the, it stopped because Bloggers learned from each other how to cover and let the world know what's going on and how to organize things on the ground. Like um, many of the bloggers in Egypt and Tunisia especially um, doubled as activists in real life and blogging was their means of getting their message across and reaching out to an audience. But we, we saw like it was like you're driving a train at full speed and then somebody holds up the handbrake. And uh, Tunisia, uh, I mean, Libya is a U-turn. Bahrain is a U-turn. Saudi Arabia, they, weren't, they had a protest date planned and the joke was there were more police on the streets than on the main squares than, than actual people mm -hmm. because governments too learned how to repress those movements. I'd like to get back, you've already touched on a bunch of very interesting issues, I think, to the solidarity question a little bit later, but I think one of the very important statements you already made is um, the role of the platforms, but that it also takes a person to stand and perhaps face a gun to make a revolution happen mm -hmm. in the end. And, and um, of course, we're not going to just be speaking about the you yeah. know, countries that have been in the press uh, and in our attention, but also have a little bit look a look at different countries in Africa and, and different regions. And of course, the other country that's been in the press was Cote d'Ivoire, uh, where just um, now we've had the step down of the president and all the terrible news, what's happening in the power vacuum in the meantime. So Claire, in, in a country like Cote d'Ivoire, has social media or internet played any kind of role in the protests that we've been watching against the uh, president? Yes, it did, and it did. it's one of the cases where it played the best and the worst of roles, mm -hmm. because since the, uh, the budget election in November, last November, uh, what happened is a lot of Ivorian are abroad, in France, in the Francophone world, so African countries, especially in West Africa, are not only the people living there, um, they are also a diaspora abroad uh, with a lot of influence because diaspora is there to, to bring news, to bring opinion, to bring help to um, their, their own people on ground. Now, what happened is that during December and January, we've seen the worst of uh, what can, you know, social media can do because uh, with two opponents uh, pitting, pitted against each other, you had about a thousand of people um, expressing the most disgusting thing online on Facebook. Facebook became, uh, and Twitter, but Facebook mostly became a killing field of its own because you could see the video of uh, uh, the murders, you know, you could see uh, the tortures, uh, and people were laughing at it. You know, the comments, people were so far gone into this hate trip on Facebook and on Twitter that you had comment rejoicing, we've killed a few, right? Many more to come. So one wonders what would have happened in Rwanda some years back if we had at the time had Facebook and Twitter. Would it have sold something? No, right? It's, um, Twitter is the same, but at the same time, it's um, in the very last week, the past week, we've seen the best. We've seen the best of the, especially on Twitter, where four people, Two in Ghana, refugees, Ivorian refugees in Ghana, because uh, 
they were, some of them were threatened and had to flee. Um, and two people are on ground in Abidjan, that means a country, a town that was looted where you could not go out even to ask for help, where women had to give birth at home with no doctors, no nothing, where me there were food shortage and medicine shortage. They decided just four people between two countries to establish a lifeline on Twitter, and it worked. I mean, it worked. I've seen it unfolding before my eyes. On day one, they said, we have to do something. On day two, they went to see a provider in Ghana, in Accra, the capital of Ghana, and asked, could we have a hotline, some five telephones? On day three, they asked for money online, and they got it. On day four, they started getting calls, real calls, and on, um, on a line saying, um, uh, there are looters in my garden, please help me. Um, I've got a, a corpse right in front of my door, please tell someone to remove it, I've got kids. The most awful human situation laid out bare on Facebook, on Twitter, and they did. They found goodwill doctors who were ready to go out despite the danger and assist people, and then they said rigged up doctors from abroad, giving consultation over the phone, and then they, tr they the sheer power of it, of this uh, energy against what was happening, succeeded in getting uh, Orange Telecom and a few big media group, um, sorry, telecom group, uh, in giving free units. So you could ring for free, you could help. And it did wonders, and right now, I've seen it evolving. They're still doing things. Of course, it's still horrible. Now, what has evolved is, you can call now the number so, 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 if you've got, uh, charred body or remove you know, corpses in your street or in your garden, they'll come and take care of it. But I mean, this amount of horridness has, has not, well, I don't know, but for myself, and I've seen a lot with Iran, et cetera, I had never seen that. Mm. So you see, one has to just say that um, they are just the medium. They're not good or evil. Facebook and um, they, whatever is behind it, it's the people behind it that makes the power of social media. And in the case of Ivory Coast, we do have seen the best and the worst. And that has to be kept in mind. Mm, I thought it's really interesting. And I think it's a very important point also to make at the beginning, the ambivalence of the media that we're actually looking at as platforms. I mean, the one thing that, well, as the moderator, I'm not supposed to comment on things, but just because you mentioned Rwanda, I think the one thing one can say um, is that as opposed to maybe a radio station that's owned or run by one uh, side of the, of the people, let's say, or one party or one group, one ethnicity, um, at, at least these media have a multi-directionality and not just one signal coming out, but the possibility to respond to. So I suppose that's you know, one point that's important to make, how are these media perhaps different than other media we've seen in use for also very dangerous forms of mobilization in Africa. Hmm. Um, and of course, I want to say, if you want to respond to each other, please feel free to do so. And if you have questions, then I will be really glad to take them as well. I think we have microphones. It's very hard to see you, unfortunately, but I think we have microphones up in the front in both sides of the room. Um, and Ludger, you work in Ethiopia, a party, a, a, a country that's ruled by one party, a very authoritarian state. I'd like to, I'd like to not just ask you a question, but um, I'd like to start by reading you a quote from a blog which is published by an Ethiopian called Endakachu. Um, and I've been reading his blog for, for a few weeks now. I got to meet him online, which has been very nice. And he says that in his opinion, if there was to be an, a, a hero in Addis uh, and like a social media generated insurrection of protest, then it would be, uh, it would not manage, it wouldn't work out because uh, it would not manage to evade detection by Ethiopian telecommunications intelligence services in their infancy. Instead, they would get caught and crushed through the blocking and filtering when they start to bud. And offline measures would not be ru ruled out as well. So he feels little hope for these media playing any significant role. Would you agree with that statement? Well, they did try it once back in 2005 during the elections. Um, they mobilized through SMS at the time. Um, despite the Ethiopian telecom desperately trying to shut off their SMS service at the time, and the result was 200 people left dead, most of them students. So they did try back in 2005. As we speak now, security agents are staffing the internet cafes in Addis Ababa and the major cities. 
making sure that mobilization is not taking place. There have been uh, Ethiopian exile groups calling for a major protest for May 28. So the whole security uh, establishment is on high alert. And uh, as a matter of fact, if I can just uh, tell a little story from this morning, um, I had a, a long talk with the Ethiopian ambassador to, uh, to Germany about the jamming of our shortwave signal to Ethiopia. Uh, you know, Deutsche Welle transmits to Ethiopia in the local language. It's one of our most popular programs. We've been running it since 1965. It's hugely popular and it's being jammed every time um, we have uh, an election on the corner or something major is happening. So I went again to see the ambassador to complain. Interestingly enough, um, they are uh, unfreeing our website in Ethiopia. What I'm trying to say is they go through a lot of trouble and money to block our radio signal, but the internet is free. Yeah. Same content. And I think this speaks volumes on the importance of traditional media in sub-Saharan Africa. And I quite like to sort of cut through a bit of the hype, the Facebook hype, the Twitter hype that we've been seeing and reading about. Um, as far as we've been following the Jasmine Revolution, I would argue, and I stand to be corrected, that Al Jazeera played a big part, if not a major part, and a bigger part than Facebook and Twitter in mobilizing grassroots support. Amira, I don't know if you agree on that one. Uh, um, the, the role of Al Jazeera varies from country to country. Al Jazeera did not pull its full weight in Syria, for example, or Bahrain. Uh, Al Jazeera was there 24-7 in Egypt, uh, and when they jammed their signals, Al Jazeera did, did what m mainstream media like doesn't usually do, which is like it went and it uh, uh, broadcast material f online, which is like from YouTube and other medium, and that's what all the mainstream media have been doing with those revolutions uh, across the Middle East. And this is very interesting for me because over the past five, six years, my main argument with mainstream media, whenever they ask me, how do you know that the blogs and the citizen media people you're quoting are credible? And now I want to ask them that because I believed in social media, I believed in the credibility of those sources, but mainstream media has always been doubting those people. Uh, back to Al Jazeera, um, with Libya, it, uh, now it's war because they kidnapped their journalists and they killed their cameraman, so it's like Al Jazeera is out there to really cover Libya. With uh, Tunisia, Al Jazeera went in later in the game, along with everybody else, and the Tunisians were screaming, how come the Iranian revolution got more airtime, like the protest, the green movement in Iran? Why did it get more airtime than the Tunisian revolution? Why aren't people interested in the Tunisian revolution as much as they were interested in Iran? Tunisia only started being covered by mainstream media three weeks into the revolution and it took 29 days to topple bin Ali so the mainstream media was only there for the last week after all the dirty work was done I think as far as I watch the situation you know there's a lot of um, toing and froing and yeah. especially in I'd say in the situation in Egypt uh, in the situation where there was an internet cut off Al Jazeera's role of course because before Al Jazeera itself got shut off, grew in importance for the real time and direct coverage for Tahir Square, for example, and of course also the reach, the distance. I mean, fact is a lot of people um, still don't have the connectivity in Africa to watch online streaming uh, 24 hours around the clock. So, um, I mean, we have to ask the infrastructure question at some point. I guess I would pass that one also back to you as to how far you think that classic connectivity problems, despite the spread of mobile phones and the improvement of backbone connectivity, especially in Eastern Africa in the last years, how, how far would you say that infrastructural impediments still are the main cause for the uh, digital media not having the same 
momentum, perhaps, as in North African countries? Well, it has. Well, mobile now in Africa, in Western Africa, in, in uh, Anglophone Africa as well. Um, forget about well, there are cyber cafes if you are in town, or else you've got SMSs and mobile telephone, mobile internet via telephone, and it works very well and it's spreading very fast, even in poor countries. Plus, one must always think of social media's uh, in Africa, in West Africa, as okay, the internet if you have an access at least to a cyber cafe. But then something else is a relay, SMSs. SMSs, that's why people at the far end of the, uh, you know, Mali, for instance, no electricity, um, not even a radio, right? They know, they know exactly what is happening. Why? Because there's a relay, SMSs relay the new. And back and forth, you know, for complements of information, they are absolutely aware. Now, it's true that in West Africa, uh, it's radio. Radio is the medium number one. Um, but television is watched very closely by people in power. Look what happened in Ivory Coast. Laurent Gabrou uh, went as far during the battles of Abidjan between um, Ouattara Azmans and um, to uh, presumably take the uh, antenna that was relaying the signal of... Uh, Radio um, Television Ivoirienne in a mobile truck in order to keep control. And um, <clears throat> President Gampo kept uh, you know, a close watch, and his man kept a close watch on everything that was said on the television. And people, you have to know that Abidjan people get only one channel, Radio Television Ivoirienne, so they don't have a choice. But people know, even in in the far end of Mali or Sahara, people knew about this revolution because it echoes something everywhere in Africa which is about poverty, which is about development, and which is about the wish, uh, the wanting, the yearning for freedom. And maybe you can say a few words because it's due to my lack of food French skills. Um, just a few words in general as an overview of how the Francophone blogosphere has been developing. Great. Oh, the Francophone blogosphere has been developing in, um, thanks to Cyber Cafe. And it's very lively because the new generation now knows about blogs. And most of all, once again, because they have coverage, very good coverage, of, um, of mobile internet. And that changes the world. It does. You can see it from one month to the other. The last thing I saw on Twitter, because now Twitter is very used on mobile phone with connectivity, even in villages, is about a bushfire. I mean, far away in Mali, someone was tweeting, people from such and such village, beware, the bushfire with the wind is going your way. Have you taken your herd away? <laughs> I mean, this is wild, but this is happening, right? They're to talking to each other, Twitter or SMS, and now the concept that you can talk to people very far away and ask them very personal questions and do things together, even if you've never met, is very much present. You know, people arrange even weddings. I've seen, you know, people arranging weddings for their daughters or, or boys through MSMSs. This is great because instead of marrying your daughter or your son to, you know, your usual cousin, you can sort of go further and maybe find, uh, you know, another family further away. So it, uh, it, uh, impacts, it impacts everything in Africa, even when there's no electricity, even when there's no education, you know, writing, because people know. People know and they get, you know, they get someone who knows how to read and write to relay their message. I mean, in East Africa, there's such a diversity between the state that different countries are in, it's like impossible to generalize, really. But um, perhaps you can say a little bit also on how you see the situation developing there. And one thing that I'd also be interested in talking about is like the language issue. So. Frankfurt, francophone blogosphere, anglophone blogosphere, the few people that are blogging, um, as far as I know, don't have a lot of um, situations where they really talk to each other. So there seems, seems to be a little bit of community things started to develop on both sides, but very little interaction between uh, francophone, anglophone blogs in Africa. Would you agree? Yes, very much. Yes, that's very much the case. 
Um, can I just play a devil advocate here? Please. And, and, you know, <laughs> Mix do the it up. sort of you know traditional mainstream media as opposed to hype Facebook. I want to replace this modern revolutions are digital revolutions by modern revolutions are civil society driven revolutions. Mm -hmm. Uh, coming on the plane this morning, I read a fascinating article. It was published in Foreign Affairs, and I'll give you a copy because it's hugely fascinating. Um, the, a very clever professor at, uh, of new media at New York University said, uh, rather than looking at or adopting an instrumentalist view, looking at people having or not having access to uh, Facebook, Twitter, Internet, let's adopt an what he calls an environmentalist view, looking at civil society. So in other words, you have to have a functioning, a vocal, uh, a very uh, strong civil society in order to be able to use the modern technology and the uh, gadgets and the social media uh, uh, tools to drive revolutions. I thought it was, that made a lot of sense to me. Because if you look at a place like Ethiopia, you have an internet penetration of 0.4%. This is well below even for for African standards, where internet penetration on average is 2.1%. Mm. Um, Sub-Saharan, this is sub-Saharan okay. internet uh, penetration. In a place like Ethiopia, it's a vast country, it's huge. It's Africa's second most populous nation, 88 million people. You have a Facebook penetration of 0.2%. That's what, 170,000 Facebook users? Mm -hmm. So how do you expect them now to drive a revolution, and you have a very weak society yet, civil society. Um, it just made a lot of sense to me. I think we keep looking at the sort of gadgets and the tools um, rather than looking at the level of, um, what's the word, um, sort of orga organizational skills in, in, in a given society. Um, this is very much true for Ethiopia. Um, yes, we have very different pictures in South Africa, in Kenya, in, in Nigeria, mm -hmm. where obviously, you know, uh, chat groups and, and internet groups, social media forums spring up. Um, in fact, I, I don't know, can, can, can I just read this to you? Um, I picked this up on one of the uh, bigger uh, uh, Nigerian platforms. One of the bloggers said, um, I, s I sometimes think there are too many uh, that are trying to do the same thing, spreading us out and creating more islands of people instead of bringing us together as the technology gives us the opportunity to do. This is a very Nigerian phenomenon where you have all these different platforms mm. and rather than you know, uniting them, it, 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 it spreads them apart. And then he continues, I'm, I'm particularly interested in the sites that go beyond dating or social networking for personal social uh, purposes. Um, I'm hoping Kabisa, this particular platform, will contribute to that. Oh. Uh, wouldn't it be cool, through the power of social networking, African civil society could reach a tipping point, the levels at which the momentum for change becomes unstoppable? I just had a look into the audience because just in case Sorry uh, Tobias Eigen from Kabisa is here, he's reading welcome out to, to you, come and give a statement on it. I think if we, in Africa where there's so much migration between countries, between region and between Europe, uh, and uh, Africa or Middle East, you can never separate the, f the diaspora from the country. Mm. So a lot of the change is brought by the uh, diaspora when they visit or through SMSs or through family. And there's a collective now uh, knowledge of civil society thanks to the, uh, the, um, the current of information between diasporas, migration, migrants and the people back home. Plus what I've seen is uh, um, yes, there is a collective society, even in, in um, or a sense, because um, if you look at what has been happening in, peop in um, countries lately in February, um, like um, um, Uganda, there, been, there are a lot of elections right now in Africa. Next year All of Africa is voting or has voted to, or is about to vote. Cameroon is coming up in September. So, uh, and people know, the best sign that they know, the governments know that something, something is happening, and even if uh, maybe the Re Arab revolution pushed it a bit, gave it a little uh, push, it was there, is that it is starting to censor and to uh, do propaganda by SMSs. Mm -hmm. um, in Mr. Museveni in Uganda, in February, there were elections going on, and it's the first time I've heard 
of uh, rounds of mass SMSs being sent to everyone in Uganda by an operator, a telephone telco operator owned by the state, or you know, with a majority shareholder. And what was that SMS? Is if you vote for Museveni's, and if you send this SMS to 700 other in you know, a person, you can win $100. Oh. So this is happening, this is happening. So this is the best sign that I think governments know that something is happening and they're starting to grip, you know, to put a grip on mobile telcos and mobile operators. Um, speak, a similar situation happened in Syria, like during the protests, um, a colleague of mine, Jillian, wrote a post about um, at Global Voices Online about how Syrian bread was sold with a message that we are all love you, Bashar al-Assad, and bread is a, is the main staple there. So the, it was like you think like bread and propaganda like that doesn't work. <laughs> Do you think that there are? Is Okay, governments have obviously learned a few lessons. Do you think that um, there are some particular lessons learned for or civil society organizations or media activists um, from the protests in North Africa that can be taken into other African countries? This is a question to all of you. <laughs> uh, yeah, like... People learn from each other, just like Arab countries learn from each other, just like Tunisia uh, impacted and influenced Egypt and the rest of the region, just as, uh, I call them copycat revolutions, like Tunisia just evolved and it was normal and natural, but everything else, like with Egypt, for the first time ever, we have a, a scheduled revolution, a revolution with a Facebook event with a specific date, place, and time. This, you, you don't plan revolutions like this, but there was also a timetable of Arab revolutions being circulated online, and even the main press, uh, mainstream media wrote about it, and the people were like, even the people in the countries, these things were happening, and like, Bahrain's revolution was scheduled for February 14th. And until the 14th of February, we were like thinking, will there be protests, one day pre protests with Egypt as well on that first day, on January 25th. I contacted many of the Egyptian people I know. And, Do you see anything? Is there anything happening? Because you're wary of these things. Mm -hmm. and, and yes, whether if, if Arab countries were able to impact each other and and break the sphere barrier and have those millions of people across, uh, out on the street demanding their rights, I'm sure the Africans too will pick up on that. I actually just want to get in there and follow up on that because you kind of su successfully evaded the language issue I, I raised, but maybe we can get back to that because I want to ask Amira, um, what do you think the fact that there is a common language ground in these Arab countries has, uh, how has that affected the communication between countries? Because, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but I sort of felt that, um, that there's a new kind of solidarity, or at least amongst a young generation of people, political solidarity that we can see taking place in the region that is kind of, to my knowledge, unprecedented because these are countries that not, do not necessarily have a tradition in politically supporting each other. The How do you see that? The governments have always been uh, out of touch with the reality of people. And, uh, and that's a reality you see now. Like if you talk to, if you get the chance to meet somebody called Muammar Gaddafi, who, who, who rules Libya, he'll tell you there are no protests and there is no one dying in Libya. And so like this just shows you how out of touch and out of reality Arab rulers are from the reality happening on the ground. Uh, Arabs not only have a common language, but a common set of circumstances and a common destiny, and they believe that. They believe that they, they, there are a lot of common things in common between us, and, and um, the main common thing that Arabs have gone through is that 
You have Libya, 42 years, same corrupt leader. Tunisia next door, 23 years, same corrupt leader. Egypt, 30 years, Mubarak, same corrupt leader. And the world was just dealing with those dictators. And it was only after they fell, or now that they're in the bad books of history, that the world is like, oh, dictators. But these are the same dictators, all the world leaders, and the entire international community was shaking their hand. Well, stop shops. Um, but uh, like for the, the people between, um, say, Tunisia and Egypt, or when Bahrain and, and Egypt, what, how, how is the interaction between when, the blogger when communities? Tunisia, when Tunisia happened, the entire Arab blogosphere rallied behind Tunisia. And the m main thing you heard was, we're all Tunisians. We are all Tunisians. And then it became, we are all Egyptians. And everybody rallied about it. When, when Bin Ali gave, was, when, when his, whatever, the guy who came after him, the one of four temporary yeah, the, the, the first one who came and <laughs> yeah. gave the speech and said that Ben Ali has left the country. I was sitting there in Bahrain and I watched this on TV and I was in tears. That was huge that in a police state, an enemy of the internet, those people had to go through so much just to get their voices out and break the fear barrier, go out on the street, get killed, get shot. Like these were the first vivid images we saw. And, and, and then this guy who ruled their country with an iron fist just goes. It was, it was a huge moment and, and I'm not political, I'm not a political activist, I'm just someone who stands on the sideline and sees history go by and, and, and it was a, a very moving moment for me and for a lot of Arabs around the world. When, when Egypt was happening, seeing those millions of people on the street, I'm like, it was a situation of do or die, literally. Like, they either get rid of, of Mubarak and his regime and move on and build your own country with your own hands, or all of you will die. And that's what we're seeing in Libya. Mm. Libya did not pick up. Libya, if this guy continues to lead Libya, all the Libyans who stood against him will die. He's ready to do that. So we, our hearts are with Libyan people. And, and the rest of the world, too, has shown a lot of support. A lot of support for Tunisia. Bef the people supported Tunisia before the governments reacted. We have a lot of support from all over the world. And it's the people-to-people -people connection. It's, you and me talking to each other, and you not thinking, oh, she, what interest does my government have with her government? We don't, we don't think of this on a one-on-one -on -one level, and that's what social media gave us. It gave us the chance to be ourselves and express ourselves and talk to people in our own tongue, like, not our own tongue, but like in a, in a language everybody else understands. Yeah. And I know it's very hard because they're all such heavy topics to like yeah. switch between the one <laughs> and the other question. But you did want to say something earlier on the, yeah, the involvement of any kind of community um, uh, as, a, in, as a, an expression of the different bloggers or people who are starting to use these media also in the Francophone region, or perhaps how that works in other regions in Africa. Is there a similar awareness? And I think one does. The um, Arab revolutions have a, a bit, you know, um, yeah, well, I mean, Ivory Coast suffered from that, suffered from the lack of attention because everybody was so busy, international TV media was so busy, you know, with so many sh happening over there. If there would have been more attention on Ivory Coast and what was happening and was getting sore by the day, uh, maybe things would have been a bit different. Otherwise, there are plenty of signs of hope, you know, in uh, West Africa, Senegal. Senegal is a really uh, thriving country with plenty of citizen media, plenty, and they have tough elections coming up with a president that has been in power for so many years. The whole of Af Francophone Africa is suffering and is backward 
when compared to Anglophone Africa, okay. Um, but um, there again, there's a story of, um, you know, people being in power for 20, 40 years, sometimes, you know, 35 years. Um, and this is going to, to come to an end. And we will hope uh, it's going to be a peaceful end, right? Not Ivory Coast. Uh, but other than that, I think we have... Uh, Ivory Coast made me reflect on one thing about Africa. We share a collective responsibility to on following up. Mm. Once things have happened, we have a collective relationship. I mean, we have a responsibility. We can't just say, you know, I've seen that on Twitter. I've seen, you know, I support, sign pledge and sign petition. We obviously have something, you know, another step to create, to invent, to be able to, not to be so powerless and to be able to do things and to organize maybe preparedness ahead. You know, not to leave people in terrible situation and, uh, well, dying. And look, um, like when I was just speaking to people and you look at the backgrounds of what actually caused the frustration and the breaking point for the outlet, it's of course been a mix of, of the devastating and increasingly devastating economic situation that some of these countries are in, despite some of the riches that they have. Um, but also, uh, we spoke about this a little bit earlier, about the lack of any kind of self-determination that people have, like the control of your own life, politically, but also in, in different aspects. And if I compare the situation the way that it was uh, bef before the recent events now in Egypt, and then look, for instance, again, at Ethiopia, you could say, okay, this like, economic situation, yes, bad. Um, lack of self-determination, in particular in a political context, also very bad. And then you've speak, spoken about the, the lack of availability of internet, even the lack of um, any kind of local radio to give expression. So it seems to me that there are similar needs and demands, but no outlet for this. How how do you see that situation? Well, we've seen a lot of um, uh, a few uh, uprisings in the in the Horn of Africa region, is it not? I mean, the fallout from the Jasmine Revolution in Djibouti, in in Khartoum, in Sudan, they were. I mean, the police moved in big time. Um, this was the end of Jasmine for for much of sub-Saharan Africa. So I think we have uh, a few years to go. Um, looking at Ethiopia in particular, the situation is very dire indeed. And um, we're now um, watching to see what happens on my uh, May 28th, when you know protests are supposed to then culminate in a in a public demonstration in Addis Ababa in the capital, which has not seen a, you know mm. sort of a, a mass-driven protest like this before. And let's see what happens. Whether the security forces uh, move in uh, in full swing as they did 2005. Um, Again, given the low, and I'm coming back, I keep coming back to this, to the civil society. Look, we, we did not argue with you because we totally agree with you. So you're not playing <laughs> a devil's advocate. You need to have the strong civil societies. Yes. Egypt has a strong structure. That's why Egypt is moving on. A strong Egypt women movement. If you look at the do rate of domestic abuse in <laughs> Ethiopia and the th situation of women in Ethiopia, and this is very true for a lot of African countries, not Senegal, they've moved a lot, not Mali, they have made huge moves, but uh, many countries we have a situation not very different from this one. And, um, wow, so then you have a combination of both, is it not? Mm -hmm. you, know, you don't have a strong civil society as an, an act, a change agent, and you don't have the tools. Y yeah, you need, you need to have a level of education, you need to have strong civil society, you need to develop this uh, political ideology, you need to, to explain to people that you are really oppressed and you need to stand up and, and w you need to tell people what their rights are so that they feel the need to, to, to face the guns and soldiers and policemen and in some countries, tanks. Tanks for, for asking for democracy. We actually have somebody who'd like to ask a question, which I'm very happy to see, although I can barely see you, but I would like to pass the word for the next question to you and really encourage anybody in the audience who would like to ask a question to come up, because if in the back, if even if you raise your hand, I'll never be able to see you. So please. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, we've, we've been talking about um, digital media and civil society. 
And I think um, that talking about digital media really implies also um, looking at things uh, from an international um, perspective. Um, we've been talking about digital media uh, within uh, revolutionary movements, but I think we also have to talk about, um, or this is, in this direction goes my question, um, what role, um, well, the outside world plays in, in, in that context. Um, you know, like the connections um, to other countries, um, for, for example, to Europe, United States, Asia, etc. Um, in, in order to supply, for example, direct help or simply uh, the fact of being visible, you know, of creating um, uh, an inter international public interest um, in what is going on regionally, locally. I'm asking this um, also because I felt that, what's, uh, the, that the situation uh, in Bahrain and Syria, for example, and also Saudi Arabia, there were things happening, but we learned a little about this over here. So I think that the link, you know, from over there to over here is sort of not really as well working as it was, for example, between like Tunisia and, and Europe, et cetera, et cetera. So shouldn't we like considering this, this fact also and, and, and think about the fact of, you know, solidarity, uh, digital media as a vehicle for international public, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, would you like to respond? Yeah. Oh. The, the global voices. <laughs> global voices. Okay, it's very. Uh, you bring up a very important point, and I've said that uh, the support of the international community, just normal people who pick up a cause and start to amplify the voices of those people, is very, 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 very important. I can't stress how important it is because people from the inside cannot speak. I come from a country which arrests bloggers. So even though I am active online and everything, over the past few weeks, I have not written anything about Bahrain because I don't want to endanger myself. And I, I th am I endangering myself? Anybody from the Bahrain government here? <laughs> no. <laughs> anyway, and it's... Oh, so, so, what's, <laughs> so what's wrong with the link, you know, like between Syria uh, li uh, and the other countries that are obviously not so visible? I mean, that we don't learn so, uh, we learn so little, you know, from what's going on there. What's uh, wrong? The thing is, people on the ground are too, uh, uh, just a few people are active online. Uh, if you follow our coverage on Global Voices Online, where I'm the Middle East and North Africa editor, we try to highlight some of the voices which are active on social media networks, and then you can go and follow those people and, and learn more about the situation. Not a huge mass of people are active. The Egyptians have been really uh, forthcoming and clear and loud in getting their voices across because there is a huge and dynamic uh, citizen media scene there. In Syria, that's not the case. Any other responses, or should we go for the next question? Yes, you were talking about languages. As far as Africa is concerned, it would be something very good to establish bridges between the French-speaking and English-speaking in Africa, because they are not talking to each other. There's a Togo, for instance, French-speaking, same size of, as uh, Ghana, uh, same resources, same population roughly. One is very ahead, you know, had election, transparent election, and is thriving economically, and that's Ghana. And the border country, Togo, is lagging behind with the same president for the past 20 or 30 years. So just talking, you know, uh, abolishing the language barrier would be a great help, I think, in Africa. Hi, uh, my name is Mark Terrell. Uh, I do regime change, working on these things practically. And I'd be very interested from the panel's comments on three different issues that haven't been mentioned so far. Um, the first is the role of demographics. Half the population of North Africa is below 25. The average age of Syria is 22. And half the population of Yemen is below 15. So you have a whole bunch of young people who quite often uh, don't have jobs. So that's the first point, that this is a young person's revolution as much as anything. Um, the second thing is that if one looks at Egypt, 
The mass uprising in Egypt took place once they turned off the internet and the phone system. So this then has the concept of activating the nodes. It effectively made everybody angry because you turned off something people loved. And then the third thing is a regime change by design. What is interesting being quite involved in this is that a number of the protest movements are actually led and designed. Um, there was a movement that's taken place over the last four or five years for people to become educated in protest movements. So right now, for example, the United States government, the State Department funds the National Ed um, Endowment for Democracy. And there is actually a whole bunch of trained activists in many, many countries around the world. And so therefore, there is actually some form of design behind this. Not government-led, but it's actually people that have been trained. So I'd be interested in those three comments. Thanks. <laughs> three very important issues. <laughs> Do you want to start, Amira? Yes, young population. Yes, uh, people with access to online media. And yes, it, it is helping a lot. You, the young are, are seeing the rest of the world. Uh, they're, they're seeing the pace. And the young are not ready to live like their parents and grandparents did. So that is one. Egypt, the internet, cutting off the internet was one of Mubarak's worst moves because instead of people sitting and watching it on YouTube or following it on Twitter, they had to go out on the streets because when he cut off the internet, the attitude was he's going to do something really evil away from the prying eye of the rest of the international community. So let's go out on the street and prevent this. And as for the role of the US, now, this is the role of the devil's advocate, where you give people, you give people the tool, and then you say, uh, let's see what happens. The U.S. has not taken a single strong uh, what's the word? stance towards, towards any of those revolutions until really late in the game. So, okay, fine, it promotes freedom of speech, it promotes democracy, it protects certain aspects and intervenes whenever there is a situation, but overall, the U.S. still protects its interests, and for, uh, for the 18 days the Egyptians were protesting, Mubarak was still uh, the U.S.'s number one choice until the last few days when they were like, okay, you'd better move. And again, it's, it was a U.S. decision. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I see one more person standing by the microphone. Okay. Um, yeah, thanks. Um, some Columbus blogger, Jude, mostly. And, well, Lutka, you, were, um, you mentioned uh, Clay Sharkey's um, well, call for more attention towards the environmental and, and, and civil society. Um, uh, the, the importance of the civil society, but uh, isn't it that, and he also argued that um, network media can actually help uh, building civil society, and I was particularly um, uh, re reminded of the work of, um, I think, an economist, Ragnar Overa, who a couple of years ago argued um, that uh, mobile phones in, in, uh, in Africa help um, enhancing trust between, uh, well, economic partners, but uh, couldn't networked media also um, support uh, the creation of nationwide civil, of a nationwide civil society, which from my little knowledge I have about Africa is lacking in many countries? Thank you, Zeman. Can I just be sure I understood the question correctly? Can mobile phones enhance sort of networking and building civil society in Africa? Is yeah, the especially question? across uh, larger distances than existing, uh, before the mobile phones and before so network media. Okay. On a nation scale yes. or even on a regional scale? Yes. Definitely, definitely on a regional okay. scale. You see that happen in, uh, in East Africa a lot, where you have one uh, a, a, a regional uh, provider moving into countries like Tanzania or linking countries like Tanzania, Kenya, and Uganda. Um, it has created a, a sort of regional identity which was not created on a political level before. You have a, a political entity called the Eastern African Community. Um, it's considered pretty useless by most people concerned. The minute a Safaricom moved in to connect all three countries, mm -hmm. providing SMS services, cheap telephone calls, um, you know, people not 
needing to sort of change their SIM cards and, you know, if you get on a flight from Nairobi to Kampala. Um, this very much made this concept of let's move together on a regional level happen. So yes, big yes. Um, certainly mobile technology, um, which is leapfrogging um, outdated um, technology, obsolete landlines, uh, which is, has been traditionally a big communication uh, obstacle in, in Africa. It's happening a lot. Uh, we see that happen at Deutsche Welle because now we're busy, you know, we, we're sort of moving away from social media. We're looking at playing content onto mobile phones in Nigeria. This is the future. It's happening in Kenya. It's happening big time in Nigeria. It, it will happen at some point in Ethiopia as well. Uh, another 10 or 20 years we're talking here. Um, Claire, do you agree? I totally agree, and I say, you know, I would like just to add that this is why it is so important to watch big telcos and what um, is happening with censorship and big telcos in Africa. Mm. Because the, uh, this is now, you know, in, this is the danger zone for censorship, mobiles in Africa. I see some more people queuing up. I can't, please, please come. <laughs> Not her. <laughs> And if, I'm, if I can see you correctly, you will also be holding a session tomorrow, right? Yeah. yeah. Please feel free to advertise for it while you're on the microphone. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'm an Egyptian blogger, um, and as you said, um, I will be speaking tomorrow at 5 here. Um, actually, I have a comment and a question to Claire. So the comment, um, um, first, I thank you very much for touching, for reading up the, um, the topic of the civil society. Um, however, I'm not sure that having a strong civil society is a must um, or it's, it's needed to get um, an active um, action on the ground. Um, because in a dictatorship, um, it's, not, it, it's not an atmosphere for us, for an active civil society. Like in Egypt, we, we, ha we have been so far under an emergency state. So the civil society, of course, is not working, is not doing jo uh, their jobs perfectly. To get a fund, you have to get the approval of state security, to, have to get the approval of the police. Um, the law is not in your side at all. And most of the, most of the NGOs um, even could not get registered, so they rejected themselves in an enterprise. Um, so I'm, I'm not sure that uh, having a strong civil society, um, and one of the things um, um, Mighty Mouse Q didn't know, um, is that over the revolution, um, a very strong um, law center, which was the one uh, who defending the arrested people, was stormed by the army and all, all people were just arrested and even the, the, their SIM cards were, um, were removed from their mobiles. Uh, the chips of, of the computers also uh, were removed. Um, so, um, of course, civil society got to play a role, but I'm not sure it's the main thing. Um, Please, no, not during the revolution, but in the build-up to it. Yeah, of like course. This is absolutely. This is what I was going to say. Now, in Egypt, uh, most of the organizations that gets funds, um, they are a bit worried, so they are not giving funds to the civil society. And a number of the organizations have been um, helping. Um, they are very worried these days because, like, in six months, they will not have funds to continue. Um, the organization who gives them funds thinks like. Maybe it's not the perfect time uh, to give out money for a country that we don't know um, exactly if, the, if it's stable enough to receive funds. So uh, I think that this is a time that you should just push more money to the civil society. Uh, instead of holding programs for bloggers, da, 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 just give, give the money to the local organization and let them defend uh, the new state. The question uh, for Claire is that um, the Francophone blogosphere not the, <laughs> the Frankfurt blogosphere um, um, can, yeah, includes um, Arab bloggers, like the Tunisian and Moroccans, most of them blog in French, um, African, Africans, uh, like in Sub-Saharan, and also European, like uh, Swiss, uh, French. So um, do all of them connected, since they are blogging using the same language, are they connected? And if yes, what are the the topics that bring, bring um, them together, and if no, how could the blogging um, just pulling them together? Oh, okay, Francophonia is, um, 
Yes, in a way they are more and more connected. And thanks to Tunisia, because Tunisia um, you know, raised such an interest that every blogosphere in Africa, in Canada, wherever there's Francophonia was talking about it. And that was the first link. And yes, now they are connected through Twitter because Twitter is lightweight. And uh, African um, using Twitter are so interested now in following people from Canada, people from or the diaspora or not the diaspora. <coughs> so it's very, um, we're in the first stage, but I can see that now La Francophonie is linking, linking and especially, uh, strangely enough, especially uh, thanks to Twitter. Twitter is doing a lot to mix people and to make them follow and you can, you know, you can have a Swiss person uh, following someone in Mali and if you've got Senegal um, following, um, of course, Tunisia, but anybody else in, in, uh, in Africa. And that has to be promoted because um, the Francophone bloggers are now, just now, thanks to Tunisia, thanks to the uh, Tunisia, the Arab Revolution, finding a common ground and a common topic. Before very much, you know, French Canada talked about French Canada, France talked about it herself or itself, <laughs> Africa talked about, you know, the neighboring country, and it's provided the common ground to have now exchange between bloggers uh, around Africa. I think it's very important. Two more people have joined. Yes, hello, my name is Marco. I'm a, jo a freelance journalist and blogger. Um, I'm just wondering, traditionally, um, totalitarian states tried to get their hands on media outlets to control your public opinion. Um, and when, when, we, when I listen to this, um, I get the impression that it's very important to get the control of the provider nowadays, um, providing like this um, SMS services, DSL, internet connections, whatever. Um, is there a trend um, that you can maybe see that in these states, um, yeah, the regimes try to get their hands on these providers? So. And if it is like that, what can be done about it? And is it a real, is it really a threat for all these uh, revolutionary movements? Or, yeah, I would be interested in hearing your opinion on that. In the case of Ethiopia, I can tell you, um, they never let go of the provider in the first place. So you have a state monopoly, and it will be another 10 years before they even engage into any sort of joint venture talks with Malaysia Telecom or Deutsche Telekom or anybody. So this is very much the same for Eritrea, uh, and you have a number of countries where um, the least thing they will, the, or the last thing they will let go of is the national telecom and the service providers of any, you know, sort of outlet, communication outlet. Um, this is now Ethiopia. At the same time, you could, sorry, I'm just going to question, uh, I mean, on the other side, you could say that countries which have gone further in liberali liberalizing their telecommunication structure and have made advances on letting like private players in like Kenya are the countries that we're seeing, you know, bringing out software innovations and, and a lot of stronger usage of digital media. So I think that's um, a yeah. thumb rule. Mm. Uh, the problem with French, Af what's called ex-French Africa, Francophone Africa, it's very often the people in power are major shareholders in telecom enterprise. Right. Which is also the case in Kenya, by yes, the way. Yes, yes. Yeah. Obviously, it's hugely profitable. And um, then again, you have a the telecom becomes, or the, the mobile company becomes a political player. You know? yeah, and then the whole thing starts between. again. So yeah, yeah. let's <laughs> also keep not it in Not only mind. that, but governments too control what the telecom can companies, like when the Egyptian government switched off the internet, it didn't switch it, it instructed the telecom companies to do that and they abided. And it's the same with other countries where uh, internet filtering is done across the region, internet monitoring is done across the region. We've had cases uh, in the Middle East and different countries where uh, even uh, a chat on something like MSN or Gtalk has been monitored and the people who were involved in this chat were uh, imprisoned or, you know, had 
action taken against them. So we know it's monitored, we know it's filtered because, because it's filtered. And then the other tactic is when there is a problem happening in any of those countries, they slow down the speed of the internet <coughs> Sorry, to the extent that you cannot upload a video or a photograph. Thank you. I think we have w we'll take one last question, and there's one more person, so that that's perfect. I just want to take another question. Okay, hello. my name is Uwe Hall, well, better known as Bicyclist. I got a uh, slightly different question about the factor of education, uh, in which I mean educating the Western countries about what's happening really in the, in the states that are suppressed by dictators, because normally you get, even in the Western countries, the filtered view of the media. And is there a sort of, of, of an educational factor in, in spreading the word through Twitter, through Facebook? I mean, from the, from the, the like, like the revolution in Egypt, most of the information spread through Twitter in the first place. And that's, what, that's what, where, the, where the information was spread in the Western countries. Is there a factor of an educational issue in the... In the in these, these social media platforms. Educational, like you mean people know how to read and write? Or? No, 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 like uh, informing the Western countries about what's happening really in Egypt, okay, in Tunisia. Twitter was, was a, a very important tool because we got everything that was happening from so many different players, many, many, many hundreds of players in real time. So even if you're like, is this real? Did this really happen? You had like 500 people who were all at Tahrir Square telling you what they're seeing and what they're witnesses in real time. So that was why it was really important and it was the fastest medium. On Twitter you can share photographs and you can take them with your cell phone and you can also uh, you tape videos and, and broadcast them. Uh, you could do like Facebook too, you could upload things to it and it's, it's just a medium which was quicker and easier to use and uh, through a phone, a phone, a phone connection. What, what Egypt did and what many of the other countries are doing is that they also jammed the signals uh, on, on the square during the, the, the peak of the protest. So what the Egyptians did was those who lived in apartments and areas with, with wireless, they opened their system and let the people use it. So people were using whatever tools and means they could get their hands on to spread the message and let the world see what was really happening on the ground. What you see is you follow news by, by those activists who are writing it, but there is also a huge wave of disinformation and government propaganda at the same time. State TV, state radio, and, and all the other uh, propaganda apparatus by those governments are working overnight, day and night, to discredit those revolutions, to discredit those protesters. And even online, you see government trolls in full force spreading hate, lies, propaganda, threatening uh, activists, and harassing them. So those people who are standing, when, when there is a shooting, for instance, and they're shooting someone, any human being's first reaction is to run for cover because we're not used to hearing gunshots. It's, it's, it means danger, it means run, it means go. You don't stand there with a camera filming it. But this is what we've seen during those protests. I, I think if I understood your question correctly, what could also be said is that in countries that we have very little news coming from, of course, for people who are interested, platforms such as Global Voices or uh, the few, you know, those are the 12 blogs that exist in Ethiopia that are actually blogging from Ethiopia, definitely serve a function of informing mm -hmm. the public. In, and this, it's coming back to the diaspora issue as well, in particular people living in diaspora mm -hmm. about what's actually happening in the countries. Would, would you agree? Totally. You know, a lot of information from little country 
comes with the diaspora and now they're picking up fast and there is tolling. I've just seen a new site about Ethiopia on Facebook. And if ever, you know, there's going to be maybe sometimes an upheaval or a revolution, they've got, you can see that the Ethiopian abroad, exiled Ethiopian, have looked at Tunisia, looked at Egypt and thought deeply Mm -hmm. and opened a Facebook account and invited as many, you know, Ethiopians they knew from the diaspora to be ready just in case. The yeah. other thing is that there are a lot of tools as well and a lot of global communities which are working to spread the word. Like when the internet was cut from in Libya, part of in Libya does not have any internet. So what they've done is uh, activists came online and decided they came together and decided, let's have phone lines, like you could call, and then the, your message would be tweeted or translated or spread. Mm -hmm. So uh, players from around the world, from different companies, from corporations, individuals, activists, they're all pulling the resources and doing whatever they can to, to help those people on the ground get their word across. Thank you. You're welcome. You're very welcome. I <laughs> actually wanted to ask a question at the beginning, which I forgot, and I'll ask now perhaps to uh, close off with. But you, uh, you weren't involved in the Best of Dogs jury, right? But Clan, Amira, you were. And I think yesterday you actually sat together to chose the winners, right? And it's publicly announceable also, correct? So um, the, the, best, the overall Best of Blog award was won by? A Tunisian girl, Lina Benmeli in Tunisia, Thank who you. has been blogging since 2007 under her real name, taking the risk, writing very frequently, denouncing censorship, denouncing repression, never letting go. It's not a fancy blog with plenty of widgets. It's a um, you know, plain Google blog, uh, bloggers blog. But for day, I mean, for years, she's kept at it. And when it happened, she was the first to report internationally in English about um, uh, Mohammed Bouazizi setting himself in fire in a godforsaken town nobody had ever heard about at that time called the Sidi Bouzid, you know. And she went there and she took pictures when the police, uh, um, well, repressed, you know, shot with live and real bullets. She went there and she went into the home of people who had lost a son or a brother and took pictures of the morning and took pictures of the body to just have, that was a long time ago, that was before Ben Halley uh, uh, was toppled, that was a time when it was very dangerous and she took pictures with a simple camera and posted it just to have the proof some, something you know awful was going on and it started this way. So I think you know blog is before everything, anything else and I'm glad that you know the jury um, found a common sense on that is a voice, and a voice can go very far, and be heard very far. And I think the winners, yes, I think that deserves more applause. And I think the actual prize will be awarded to her at the and to the other winners, of course, at the Global Media Forum, Deutsche Welle Global Media Forum in June. Correct? Yes. Yes, and another winner, the Prix RSF, uh, Net Freedom, um, Reporters Sans Frontières, is very important. It's another blog by a single girl in Mexico where awful things are happening. You know, the um, war between the drug traffickers and the Mexican police. Uh, this, is, uh, those, uh, this is another killing field opening itself in Mexico. No, no one is talking about it. So it's really important that Julia this blog be read and it's called In la Sombra del Narcotrafico. And you can find all the links and I think descriptions, I guess, as of yesterday on the Best of Blogs website, right? Okay. Say it into the microphone, I don't. <laughs> um, so. I guess that brings us to the end of the discussion that we have now, but we will just continue discussing the topic um, before we close off the session, maybe just to take the opportunity to advertise. We've already mentioned the session that we'll be focusing on Egypt here tomorrow 
afternoon. There will also be another workshop taking place tomorrow at 3 o'clock, which will look in particular at, uh, again, at Ethiopia, actually, in some detail, and also Senegal and neighboring countries. And we'll discuss similar issues, but also look at some technological aspects and cross-media usage. So um, I'm, I'm really glad to see this topic represented in different sessions at Republica this year and would leave all, all of you the opportunity to give some close, closing words. I think what we've done is to state some truisms that we perhaps knew before, but in very interesting contexts. I mean, the fact that we all know that people make revolutions and not just media, and media can be used for mobilization in different directions, of course, but um, also the role that this is currently playing and not just in the future in African countries in particular with the in view of mobile usage, I think uh, is, is something that's, yeah, I'm, I'm glad that we could share with everyone today. And I think also one thing would be to really go out there, like you just said, uh, Claire, to really look at these blogs, follow these people, um, see what the people behind the, the platforms are, and, and also support them just by knowing about them and by creating awareness about their work. Would you like, I, if you have some closing, closing words, then please let's do a okay. short round, perhaps. On second thought, I'm ready to compromise. I guess it's civil society and the gadgets. So let's take the two together. And perhaps yeah. education, right. which was also and brought education, in as an important, important factor. Okay. Yeah. Thank <laughs> you. Final one must go to Amira. She's our hero. I'm sorry. <laughs> We're out of words. We're, okay. Well, will we have the opportunity to speak to all of you for the rest of the day? Will you be around? Yes. Okay, super. And we will actually continue the topic now in a, in a following session, but we'll start to concentrate on a different region. So maybe there's a seat for you next to you. Maybe for the last final few minutes, I'm having a look out to the stage. I'd like to welcome Ms. Rosanna Hammond up on stage. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Welcome. Charlie. Thanks for coming up, Rosanna. No, I just want your hand. Lots I can have it. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Want to have a quick seat? So um, I was hearing you as you were speaking, and I'm, I'm, I know all of you, and I'm a great fan of all of you. And I was just thinking of, you know, the whole concept of connection. We have people connected now, right? We are hubs for each other. We are proxies for each other. We are voices for each other. We are hands for each other. In, in the gadgets and in, in, in the networks, they just are means of getting us together. And at four o'clock right now, I would like very much if you would go to uh, the workshop number two in Kalkscheune. We're going to talk, Vanina and, and, and I and Geraldine will be speaking about a network and social media in South America and a little bit of the sunny side <laughs> of social media too in South America and also how uh, all of this that you were talking about, how, how all the protests, the activists, how it impacted people in Brazil how we try to help, how we, we saw things, how we saw, I mean, the impact of seeing Neda dying in, in Iran, you know, and, and things that we never thought of. And then we feel so much connected now. And this is really the good part of social media is empowering people uh, in a way that we feel like for the first time we are one world, we are one human race, and we really sometimes do feel together uh, in, in, in a simple, you know, tool like Twitter, but then the, the, this feeling changes your posture and you feel like learning and you feel like getting uh, more information, not because the press is putting there, but because you feel the need, like, how can I go to sleep? I felt, that, how can I go to sleep if I don't know if the girl that was with the laptop on the roof getting connected through a phone, is she okay, is she all right, you know, can I help her in some way, uh, I just can't, you know, like, I'm responsible for her too, now that I know, and, and, and this is very much changing the, the, you know, the world, I think, so I would like you very much to come at four o'clock to, to, you know, to hear a little bit about uh, social media in, in South America, thank you. Thank you so much, Rosanna, I think, yeah. What a...
fantastic closing and opening statement at the same time. So with that, I'd just like to thank the three of you very much for the discussion and would like to welcome all of you to move along with us to Kalkscheuner to join in the discussion on Latin America. Thank you very much. Thank you.